Okay, good to see all of you here this evening. We're grateful to have this opportunity to assemble together and to study together the Bible. We're thankful that you are here. A busy week with Christmas, this being a couple of days ago, and New Year's upon us now. Uh, probably some who are still traveling and not with us, uh, maybe gone for the week, and um, guests visiting with us, and we welcome them. And we're grateful that uh, you are here and the opportunity that we have to come together this evening and study the Bible uh, together. We are in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 1. We'll begin in verse 12. There are new handouts. It's the same as you'll see on the PowerPoint. But uh, if you would like a handout, they are out there. And they have only been out there for about 10 minutes. So if you were here prior to about 10 till, you did not see these handouts, but they are out there now, and Shane has them. If you would like a copy, you can raise your hand, and Shane will be happy to provide a copy for I'm putting, I'm putting Shane to work tonight because I did not have them out there. I appreciate Shane in doing that. While he's doing this, we will take our prayer request. Just be sure to raise your hand high so Shane can see you. And um, again, after our prayer, we will begin in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 12. And carry us on into chapter 2 uh, as well. But uh, we want to begin with our prayer request. I have three that I know of for prayer that we will mention at this time. Uh, one, uh, sympathy is extended to Melinda McCreelis upon the passing of her sister Yvonne Hill. Uh, her sister passed away yesterday. And uh, there will be a... Um, Memorial, her remains will be laid to rest at a later date in, in Georgia. So we want to remember Melinda McCreelis, Tyler's grandmother. So this would be a great aunt to Tyler Sin, Tyler and Hannah Sin. So we want to remember uh, this family. Did I pronounce that? Yvonne? Yvonne, Yvonne Hill. And uh, we want to remember this family uh, in, our, in our prayers. Also, little Esther Martinson, Esther Rose Martinson, will be having surgery tomorrow at Children's in Birmingham. I'm not really sure the details, but uh, this uh, information was just given to us, and she will be having uh, surgery at Children's in Birmingham tomorrow. So we want to remember uh, Esther Rose Martinson. It, it is with her shunt? Okay, it's with her shunt. So we certainly want to remember her uh, in, our, in our prayers. Spencer Parker, Spencer and Esther Parker, they're not here tonight. That's why the young adults are joining us. Spencer's been teaching that class the last couple of months, and I'm not really sure what's going on, but uh, just said he would not be able to be here tonight, not feeling well. So that's the three that I have. <clears throat> Prayer request, are there? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Kelby Smith. Now remind me, the, can, the, that's Doug's dad? Doug, who was here on Summer Series. Kelby preached at Florence Boulevard for many years. Okay, Kelby Smith passed away t today. Today, longtime preacher at, uh, at Florence uh, Boulevard. Many of you uh, knew him and remembered him. I, I never met him. I do not, I do not think I ever met him, but I have heard the name. A number of times. So certainly we want to remember his family in our prayers. His son, Doug, is it Doug, Doug Smith? D Doug spoke for us this past summer on our summer series. He's now at the Boonville Church of Christ in Boonville, Mississippi. So certainly we want to remember the Kelby Smith family in our prayers. Any other prayer requests? Still a lot of people will be traveling uh, over the next week or so uh, with Christmas wrapping up and New Year's coming. Remember here Sunday night uh, after our evening worship, uh, our young men will lead worship Sunday at 5. It's a fifth Sunday, something we started this year on 5th Sunday p.m. The young men lead worship, so we're excited about that this coming Sunday. And then after worship, uh, New Year's Eve, uh, gathering games, finger foods, I think. I'm sure you can get the details from Robbie or on a bulletin board. I'm sorry, I don't know all of them off the top of my head other than it begins at 6.01 and ends at 12.01. So um, you can stay and enjoy that, and ring in the new year together. And even if you can't stay until midnight and want to uh, 
uh, want to leave early, that's fine too. Some years ago, we were doing lock-ins on New Year's Eve. That is the safest night of the year to drive if you're done by midnight because nobody's on the road until midnight. You know, everybody's out doing their own thing. They're at parties or whatever. And uh, so we, we did, uh, did lock-ins a few years on New Year's Eve. And time to time, we would go out and do stuff and then come back to the building. And uh, nobody's on the road. So, uh, but that's coming up this, this New Year's Eve. Anything else before we go to God in prayer? Okay, let's, let's pray. Dear God, our Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day that you have blessed us with and this opportunity to assemble together to study the Bible with one another. We're grateful, Father, for this congregation that meets here and for the work that we're able to do in this community and throughout the world. We pray that the work that we've done this year has been faithful according to your word to glorify you. Help us now as we begin to look to the last few days of this year to consider what we did that was right, that we can build upon, and what we did that we need to change and try to do better in the new year. We thank you, Father, for blessing us and uh, with time and opportunity to study the Bible together during these regular scheduled times. And, and Father, we pray that uh, we will uh, always put you first and glorify you. We're thankful, Father, for family and friends that we have visiting with us and in town for the holidays. And we ask your rich blessings to be upon them as they travel and our own church family here at Wood Avenue when, when they get ready to, to, to make their way back to this area. Father, we pray especially for our sister, uh, Melinda McCreelis, and at this time, and ask your blessings to be upon her and all of the family and the passing of her sister, and they might look to you for comfort and strength uh, during this time. Pray for the family of Kelby Smith. We're grateful for his uh, influence in this area in the years that he proclaimed uh, your word and preached the gospel. We ask your blessings now to be upon uh, especially his family and friends and, uh, and his passing. Father, we uh, ask your blessings to be with uh, little Esther Rose and pray that all will go well tomorrow with her surgery and that you'll uh, bless the surgeons and the caregivers with a good night's rest and they can perform to the best of their ability tomorrow and pray for Spencer and Sarah and we know it's always trying, especially on young parents and ask you your blessings to be with them. Please be with uh, all who are not well. We've had many fallen ill over the last few days. We ask your blessings to be upon them, that they can uh, regain their strength and, and be back with us soon. Bless us now as we study and keep us in your care is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we are in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 12, and this will take us into chapter 2 and verse 23. So again, the notes, the handouts that you have last week, they're going to be a little different. Uh, because again, I'm always updating notes. I'm always changing notes. And uh, we just kind of go about class to see how far we can get. And uh, if we do not complete what I had prepared, I usually go back and as I study again, then, uh, then more comes out. So this, uh, these handouts are a little different than the ones that you have from last week. Uh, and the new ones are on the tables if you would like to get them. I'm going to read chapter 1, verses uh, 12 through uh, 18 to get us started as we're searching for happiness. Here's this uh, man, Solomon. I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem twice now. He's called himself a king, chapter 1 and verse 1, and uh, verse 12. And twice in these two verses, he has told us that he was a king over Israel in Jerusalem. He said in verse 13, I set my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all that is done under heaven. This burdensome task God has given to the sons of man by which they may be exercised. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed all is vanity and grasping for the wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be numbered. I communed with my heart, saying, Look, I have attained greatness and have gained more wisdom than all who were before me in Jerusalem. My heart has understood great wisdom and knowledge, and I set my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is grasping for the wind. For much wisdom is much grief, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. So we're going to begin here. You know, what is the meaning of life? Is this question that we'll ask over and over as we study this book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon's quest, unfortunately, led him to the wrong places. 
Uh, he, he, he was there in the beginning with God. He asked God for a heart to know how to judge the nation of Israel. And God gave him this great wisdom. But as you know, in his lifetime, he starts looking elsewhere. And that's what we're going to see, especially in chapter 2. And Solomon looking uh, elsewhere for this wisdom. He had the resources and wisdom to search out. This question, as a king, a wealthy king, everything that David left him, not only in wealth, but also relative peace, he had everything that he needed to search out this question, but he was, he was searching in the wrong place. He was looking in the wrong places for uh, the conclusion. Think about how many people have you know, wasted life or they've at least missed on the greatest joys of life, and the meaning of life by looking in the the wrong places quite often that that has happened they they just they'll go throughout life and they're 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 searching and searching and searching and not willing to look to god or perhaps no one having ever directed them to god and when i think about when i read these this section chapter 1 of verse 12 through chapter 2 and verse 23 it seems as if solomon thinks that he knows what the conclusion is he thinks that he knows where he can find happiness. He thinks that he knows what, what can bring the greatest joy in life. And then throughout this book, he is then going to try to find a way to get from point A to point B. I, I know this is where joy comes from. I know this is where happiness comes from. I just need to know how to get there. I need to know how to get from where I am to where, to where happiness is or where joy is or where total satisfaction is. And so you see, especially in this section that we're studying tonight and maybe even into next week, it's he's experiencing everything. He's experimenting with it all. He's looking for it. And he, he, wants to, he wants to then find a way to bridge the gap. Here I am. Here is the conclusion. This is in my mind what I what I think will bring total happiness, satisfaction, security, or whatever. So I'm going to find a way to get there. And, and the way that he's going is the way opposite from where God is. How often do these people do that? For example, uh, one of the things that Solomon is going to talk about in this book, money. Again, let, we'll have to stress this every week. Most of what Solomon is saying is not wrong if you're putting God first and you're doing it in, in a way that is righteous serving God. Solomon's problem in these first chapters was he was doing it in a way going a, away from God. Okay, that, that was the issue. But quite often, you know, the idea is, well, money, money would buy happiness. So I know that is true. I just need to find a way to get to that point in life. And, and that's what happens. That's what happens all too often, looking for it in the wrong places. I remember years ago, I was talking with a deacon in the church, and he opened up and shared this story with me. I had no idea of knowing. But um, he said, there was a time that I had to repent. Um, he said, I, I had my mind focused on buying a new boat. And all I could think about was that boat. And he said, I was taking any and every overtime shift and extra shift that I could at work to get to the that end game, the end point, quicker, a little sooner. And, and he said, I just, you know, it didn't matter if it was Sunday or Wednesday. I was willing to, to take a shift and miss church because I wanted the boat. I wanted to conclude. That's where his happiness was, right? That's, that's, that's where, that's, that was the end point for him. That was satisfaction. So what do I need to do to get from he here to here? And oh, can I, can I minimize it a little bit? Can I do it? Can I do it a little sooner? And, you know, he said it wasn't until after the fact or sometime during the journey. I don't know. I just realized where I, what I had gotten caught up into and how much church I was missing and how that was affecting my life just because I wanted, I wanted what I thought would, would bring me joy at that point in time. And for him, it was, a, it was a boat. Notice verse 14. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed all is vanity and grasping for the wind. Notice again, this is what twice already in this chapter that he talks about works under the sun. Back three times, excuse me, verse three, under the sun. Verse nine, under the sun. And then now here again in verse 
14, under the sun. He's noticing what he can see, what the eye sees. That's what we talked about a little bit last week. He was walking by sight rather than by faith. Wanting what he could see, what he could hold, what he could possess under the sun. Rather than above the sun, rather than God, rather than looking into the heavens. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. And he says, I've seen all the works that are done under the sun. And indeed, all is vanity and grasping for the wind. Again, it's not that in of itself, some of what Solomon tried was wrong. It's, it pulled him away from God. Uh, it took the place of God quite often was the case with Solomon. And that is what is going on here. I put a question up there. Is, is what you're doing, is it important that's something to, to, to ask yourself when you think about verse 14. I've seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed, all is vanity and grasping for the wind. But we have to live life, right? I mean, we're, here we are. We're about to wrap up 2023, Lord willing. Begin 2024, and hopefully a year from now we'll be saying the same, and the next year and the next year. I mean, we have to live life. So I would sum up verse 14 by saying, is it important what I'm doing? Is it, is it godly? Uh, is it important to eternity? Is what, I, is what I'm doing, is, is it important to eternity? Is it important to church? Is it important to the, my Christian life and, and growth as a Christian? Now, some things you do, they, in one way or another, they have no bearing on the church unless they pull you away from church, Right? You know, there, there are things that, that, that you might enjoy doing, hobbies that you might have, uh, sports that you like to be a part of or, or watch or, or shows or something like that. You know, is in all of that, is it, is it important or is it it's not pulling me away from the church? That's what I'm trying to say. Am I, am I sure that this is not pulling me away from the church? Under this thought, verse 14 I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed all is vanity and grasping for the wind. I just ask myself, is what I'm doing, is it important to eternity, to my Christian life, to church, to the family also? I think coming up in 2024, I'm going to try to preach more sermons on the family. Uh, I, I, I enjoy those, as, as you know, um, but I try to not go only there. But I think I'm going to try to have at least one a month. Because I, I, I still believe that the stronger that each individual family is within a congregation, then the stronger a congregation is. A couple of thoughts came to me that I heard other men say, men that I, well, three actually, two were men and one was a lady uh, that uh, really respect these people. One, a friend of mine um, who's now preaching the gospel, uh, he retired and uh, he, he was a Vietnam vet. Uh, he was in the war in Vietnam. He told me once a few years ago, uh, and I can't remember, his son has already passed, one of his sons. And I can't remember if he said this before or after his son passed. But uh, he said, if I could tell a young man anything, it would be to work 40 hours a week and go home and spend the rest of the time with your family. And if you can get by on less than 40, do it. You know, here's a man in retirement, nearing retirement, looking back on life. And he says, verse 14, I've seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed all is vanity. He said, I'd go back and spend more time with my kids if I could. Another thought along with that, Brother Wendell Winkler, speaking to in a gospel meeting and also to preachers, he said, I encourage preachers to spend one night away from home if you want to go to a meeting or a lectureship. So you got Sunday night, Wednesday night church, one other night, spend the other four with your family. What was he saying? Say, make sure you keep your priorities in order. Make sure what you're doing and the work you're doing under the sun is not just grasping for the wind. Make sure you're fulfilling something. Make sure it, it has meaning to it for now and for in eternity. So I thought a lot about it, and I thought about how times have changed, and we're busy, right? You know, my grandmother's generation, uh, she, her parents were farmers, didn't have much other than land, a lot of land to farm. Outside of that, they didn't have much. But I thought a lot about stories she told me, even though they were pretty much working from daylight to dark, what's something that they were doing together? They were working together. And they were eating their meals together. 
So there's, there's a difference. Even though it was daylight to dark six days a week in church on Sunday, they were still together as a family. Where in today's society, today in the way we go about things, it's completely changed from that. You might be pulling just as many hours, but you're not usually with your family as much. So we have to be creative, right? We have to find other ways. And this comes into the third that was said to me. I was on a mission trip in Romania, and a man and lady I really only met on that one trip, but uh, Smith, Lowell, Lowell and Kemp, Karen, Lowell and Karen Smith, I think is their name. And she said that they have two daughters, and she said it was her house rule that the family had to eat breakfast together every morning. So that was our house rule. Because I knew once the day started, we were, we were gone different directions. And she said, that was my rule for my house. We were going to have one meal together. So I thought all that could tie into chapter 1 and verse 14. You might have other ways that you have figured out how to navigate through life and make sure that it is important. Verse um, 15, what is crooked cannot be made straight and what is lacking cannot be numbered. We usually say it today, it is what it is, do we not? You know, the wise and the wealthy, the powerful. You know, there's some problems that they can never fix. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians. There's some problems and questions that they can never fix or never answer. And we need to make sure that uh, we are, we are um, just focused on keeping our faith in God and eternity. Notice again verses uh, 16 through 18. And he's talking about this, uh, this greatness he's gained and the wisdom that he has. But he, notice what he says in verse 18. For much wisdom is much grief. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Think of a couple of ways how knowledge can increase sorrow. For example, in Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 39, Jesus talks about, well, let's just, let me just read it. Let me read it to you. Matthew chapter 10 verses 34 through 39. <clears throat> Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 34 beginning, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Verse 37, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross daily or take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Luke's account in Luke chapter 9 says daily. Verse 39, he who finds his life will lose it and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. For some, when they gain knowledge of the word of God and they choose to obey God and become a simple New Testament Christian, it produces sorrow because the family will not accept it and sometimes even be rejected. You can Afterwards, talk to our sister Wheatman if you want to about a sad case that she knew of when many, many years ago and a young man who was completely disowned by his family uh, when he uh, chose to become a New Testament Christian. And I was right here in the United States of America, you know, so it's not just overseas. And uh, so that sometimes can cause sorrow. But you think also think of the wars that are going on right now in Israel and Ukraine and uh, many other places that maybe they do not get the TV attention. It takes knowledge to build what they're using to destroy, but yet many people are suffering, increasing sorrow, the innocent who are dying at the hands of these evil people. So there is that that uh, happens in life. Years ago, I was eating breakfast, I believe it was, with a gentleman, a brother in Christ. He's already passed on to his reward. His name was uh, Hap Johnson, a great Christian man, kind Christian man, and uh, he would like to take the preachers out from time to time and and uh, have a meal with us. And he was a World War II vet. He parachute, he, he jumped. I think he made three combat jumps, three, three active jumps in combat. And I'll never forget when he said to me, I thank God for the ability to forget. Now you think about a World War II vet saying that. I thank God. For the ability to forget. Knowledge increases sorrow. Any thoughts or comments? Verses 12 through 18. Yes, sir. Uh, going back to, uh, um, uh, what was it, verse 14? Uh, no, 15. It 
it just made me think of back to Matthew, the golden rule of Matthew 7, 12 through 14, basically kind of saying the same thing as for us is the, the, the path is narrow, but the gate is wide. And I kept looking at, you know, at the first part here in the ESV, it says, what is crooked cannot be made straight. You know, and I just kept looking at it like thinking the, the gate is wide, the path is wide, but we want to stay straight. And where it says lacking cannot be counted, what's bad or, or may even be good if we're not down the straight and narrow path, so to speak, you can still be on the outside of it. Sure. So just maybe think Interesting comment going to Matthew chapter 7 uh, verses uh, 12 through 14 and the, the golden rule in verse 12 and then the two the gates, the roads, the two paths, the, the wide way and the narrow way. Uh, and uh, yes, absolutely, you know, there's, and, and, and that's the thing about in this life, even if you're on the right path that leads to heaven, it does not mean that you're not subject to some of the, these things that are going to happen to you in life and these troubles that we deal with in life. And again, this is what we must keep in mind with the book of Ecclesiastes and not this book only, any book of the Bible is ultimately the issue is priorities not in order. You've got to work. You've got to provide for yourself. Paul, 1 Timothy chapter 5, tells us that we're wrong if we don't provide for our family. It's talking about our older family members, but the same would apply to our children. So again, it's, it's, you, you have to put it all together and say, okay, what is, what is the heart of it? What is the base of it? It's priorities. And, and even when those are right, then sometimes, yeah, sometimes we... Uh, we, we still feel the effects of life around us. Yes, sir. I go back to Genesis. You know, when you think about when they got the knowledge of good and evil, and when you start to look at sin in our own life, you know, you, you don't want something until you know what that is. You know, so you start gaining knowledge of, you know, the pornography and all these different things, and that just leads you down uh, the wrong path. If you look at Solomon, you know, so many wives, so many, you know, and, and he was doing it for a good reason, what he thought, because he was making covenants with all these other countries around sure. him, but led, led the whole country over by straight. Sure. Great point. Great point. Going back to uh, Genesis, we know when sin comes in in chapter three and the knowledge of, 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 of good and evil there. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of times once you're once you're open to that sin, once you're exposed to it, uh, whether you've been tempted, allowed yourself to be tempted by it a little too long or enter into the sin. That's right. And that's an interesting point. Solomon with his wife, first Kings 11. We'll get there eventually. Um, you, you know, all those wives making covenants with um these nations, as, as kings do quite often, but you have to keep in mind it goes back to, as, as you were saying, God's law, when he told them back in the law in the book of Deuteronomy, don't do it. You know, there was a better way that, that, that they had. Uh, that, was, that was God's way. And, um, and, and, you know, and keep in mind, Solomon, again, for the most part of his kingdom, there's relative peace. Uh, and, and even, uh, I keep going back to the, the queen of the south, look at your servants, look how happy they are. And, but it, it, it changes. There's that change in his life at some point, and he starts going this, this, this wrong direction. Interesting comments. Any, anything else? Other thoughts or comments? Something triggered me more than saying in their family discussions and things that they have. Um, and I think that it was Interesting. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the, the quantity of time together in your own Christian life or family time, whatever it might be. Of, in, instead of just the, the comment made, if you did not hear, was it basically summing it up was, you know, don't I'm not putting it all into saving up for that one big trip of the year. And there's all of your quality time right there. It's, it's with family. It's family. It's quantity and spreading it out. And, 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 and I remember I was, I don't I was years ago. So, so I was watching something. I don't know. I, I could not even tell you the details, but it's basically kids who were able to make the, the make a wish or something like that. Uh, and, you know, most of them, they, they were able to go to Disney World for a week or something like that. And all of them, when asked, you know, what's, what's been a special moment of the last year or whatever, like every one of them said, 
there was this day that, that we were in the bed with mom and dad and we were all just eating in bed or something. For none of them, it was the big thing. None of them, it was the big Disney World or it was the little everyday moment that, that meant something to them, that, that stood out to these kids uh, who were uh, dealing with this. And what was the, the other part that you said? You said, uh, oh, 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 no, okay, I had a thought. Okay, also with the, 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 the Christian life and sometimes maybe just building it up for, okay, I'm going to have a quality day of study but no other days. There's a, a sermon on YouTube that uh, I would recommend you watch. Uh, David Shannon, something to do with mountains. It's really interesting. Uh, David Shannon, who's now at Freed Hardeman University, and I can't remember the title of the lesson, but it was something to do about uh, with mountains. And he, he made, made a comment that really helped me. And basically, it's God did not design us to remain on the mountaintop. And we've all been there, right? We've all enjoyed get, getting that that point where you're just you maybe you've had a really great day or week or something, and you feel like you're you're spiritually where you need to be, you've prayed and you've studied and you just feel like you're in the, the spiritual mountaintop. But then you come back down and you think, oh, what's wrong with me? And he has some interesting comments and I was thinking about that. It's, it's, not the, it's not the saving it up for a spiritual mountaintop experience and putting it all on there, but it is the, the day-to-day grind and the ups and the downs. So you might want to check that out. Okay, notice anything else? What Notice in, if we go into chapter 2, we get into chapter 2, I'll be happy when, how would you answer that question? Now I know sitting here at 7.30 on a Wednesday night around your church family, your, your answer immediately went to godly answers, right? <laughs> And they should. That's why you are sitting here on a Wednesday night at 7.30 in Bible class. But try to step away from that for just a moment and maybe try to think back to maybe when times when your mind was wandering or you're traveling or whatever the case might be. And you had one of those thoughts. If I had that, I would be happy. If I, if I had this much in the bank account, I know I'd be happy. If I could retire at this age, that, 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 that's all I want. That's what would make me happy. Some of those thoughts that perhaps we've all had at some point or another. How would you answer? I'm not asking you to answer out loud. But how would you answer? I'll be happy when. What, what, would, make, what would bring you joy? What would bring you happiness. Solomon tried to find happiness, and we're really going to get into that in chapter 2. But the question would be, as we study this, is my list similar to Solomon's list? Is your list, is it similar to Solomon's list? Let's notice some areas. Again, if you have thoughts or comments, you're welcome to speak up. Um, we, We will not complete it tonight. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Power. I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. Again, that was given to him. He's the son of David. But you think about the power that he had, and in it was not true happiness, not, not, not godly happiness. Sometimes we might think, oh, if, I just, if, I were, if I were a king, if I were in this position, that, that must be where happiness is. Personal experiences, verse 13. I set my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all that is done under heaven. Notice what he said. And he'll say that again in the chapter 2. Let me just mention that because we probably won't get there tonight. Verse 10, chapter 2 and verse 10. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was my reward from all my labor. You see that of the 
personal experiences. Whatever I wanted to do. I, and again, here's a man who's in the position that he's not limited. Perhaps all of us has experienced this to some degree. But this guy, he's unlimited as far as earthly possessions and joys would go. He can have anything he wants. And it's proven in his life. He, 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 he did get anything that he wanted. But it didn't bring him happiness. What does he say over a vanity of vanities? It's empty. Notice this because we're not going to get here tonight and some of you might not be here next week. This, I missed it. I kept missing it. I kept missing it. And it was pointed out in a book that I was reading. Go to verse 17, chapter 2 and verse 17. Here, here, this sums it up, three words. I hated life. Chapter 2 and verse 17. That sums it up. Here's a man that had everything. Three words. I hated life. Because he went away from God. That, again, that's what it goes back to. He goes away from God. He turns away from God. Even Christians are discouraged from time to time. But we keep our hope in God. Personal experiences did not buy it. Pleasure, chapter 2, verse 1. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with mirth or with pleasure. Therefore, enjoy pleasure. But surely this is also vanity. I said of laughter, madness, and of mirth. What does it accomplish? Notice I've given you a scripture reference in Hebrews chapter 11. And I wanted to use this reference. I've quoted it a number of times, or at least referenced it, I should say. And, um, but think about the similarities. When Solomon is writing the book of Ecclesiastes, he's the king of Israel. The, the greatest power in the world at that time, the greatest nation in the world at that time. But when Moses was young, being reared, Egypt was the power. Back in the book of Exodus, they were the great power. They were the wealthiest. And in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 24, by faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Notice the passing pleasures. They, 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 don't, they do not remain. And even if the pleasure remains until the end of life, then it, it's over. But I think that's interesting. Moses would have been what we might call an, what I guess an adopted grandson of the Pharaoh. See the providence of God there at work with uh, Moses' own mother uh, being able to nurse him and train him. But he had the wealth of Egypt open to him, uh, being in the home of Pharaoh's daughter, the grandson in a way of a king, an adopted grandson of a king. Here you have the son of a king who becomes a king. One said, I, I don't want that life. I'm not, I'm not going after that life. And you think about his 40 years of running away after he kills the Egyptian. And then after that, out in the wilderness, dealing with those complainers, 1 Corinthians 10. And he didn't have to live that life. He could have lived a life like Solomon. Moses could have lived a Solomon-like life with most anything that he wants. The women, the same as Solomon. He could have had it. And he chose not that life. Uh, chapter 2 and verse 3, I searched in my heart how to gratify, gratify my flesh with wine while guiding my heart with wisdom and how to lay hold of folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their lives. Remember in Proverbs, it talks about not even looking on it, the wine and what it can do to you. And look forward in, in that area. Look for it in going after the bottle, as many people look for happiness today. Luxuries, chapter 2 and verse 4. I made my works great. I built myself houses, planted myself vineyards, 
In verse 5, I made myself gardens and orchards and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools from which to water the growing trees of the grove. Luxuries. And I put a reference. We'll not read it here. Eventually we will get to it in our Sunday morning class as we're studying the kings of Israel. But you go back and if you're interested, read 1 Kings chapters 4 through 10. That's Solomon's life when he was building everything that he built. You remember as chapter 6 comes to an end, the last verse of 1 Kings chapter 6, they built the temple and it took them seven years. The f- first verse of chapter 7, I believe it is, if I have the, the numbers correct, the f- first verse of chapter 7 is he built his own house that took 13 years. So, I'm, I don't know. We'll talk about that on Sunday morning. Was the temple so important that they did it in half the time? Or was his personal luxury, personal luxuries in his house so important that it took him double the time? Think about it. I don't know. Chapter six. Read those. First Kings chapters 4 through 10. This guy had, he had it all. But chapter 2 and verse 17. I hated life. Let's see where we are. We're getting, we're getting close. I want, to, I want to notice this with you. We only have two or three minutes left. So we, we'll actually begin on this slide next week if you have your hand out with comfort. But notice this. Ah, selfishness. Selfishness. 2.10. In our text, from chapter 1 and verse 12 to chapter 2 and verse 23 in the New King James text, 40 times, if I counted correctly, Solomon says, I. This is what I noticed as I was reading the other day. That caused me to stop and count. Notice this beginning in verse 2. I said of laughter. Verse 3. I searched in my heart. Verse 4. I made my works great. Verse 5. I made myself gardens. Verse 6. I made myself water pools. Verse 7. I acquired male and female servants. Verse 8. I also gathered for myself silver and gold. Verse 9. So I became great. Verse 10, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold from my heart. Verse 11, then I looked on all the works that my hands had done 40 times. So again, we'll talk about that a little bit next week. But that's something else I also wanted to point out tonight as we're running out of time. It was about him. It was about him. He got to the point where it was about what he wanted and he wanted to please himself Rather than what God wanted for him. Any thoughts, comments? Two or three minutes left. Uh, any, any, anything that you would like to share? Yes, sir. Yeah, great point. Matthew chapter 6, verses uh, 19 forward is what was referenced. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. It's definitely, it's a heart problem. Uh, uh, you, you see, First Timothy chapter 6, for example, he talks about the love of money is the root of all evil. But then he goes on, I think in verses 17 and 18, to tell the rich how to use their money. James chapter 5 tells the rich how to use their money. And on and on you could go with that. Um, it just goes back to priorities. It just goes back to uh, if I, am I keeping my focus on God or not. In this case, Solomon has become like the rich young ruler, and his possessions made him go away sorrowful. Yes, ma'am. I was just thinking a lot of times when we have instant gratification or when we have just things given to us, you know, and, and instead of having to work hard for them, then we don't appreciate the good things in our life. And it's just kind of making me think about that. You know, like, he, he got to do whatever he wanted to do. Sure. And instantly. Sure. And, and a lot of times when we get that, we don't feel the joy that the hardships, 
you know, they kind of make us sure. appreciate it all. Yeah, easy come, easy go, instant gratification is what she's talking about here. Solomon had it all given to him. And that's something we noticed on Sunday morning a couple weeks ago. You look at the difference in Saul's kingdom. They didn't even have a blacksmith. They were not even allowed to have a blacksmith in their land to build their own weapons, to make their own weapons. The Philistines had that rule over them. And in Solomon's kingdom, silver becomes just common. So yeah, that just which is, is given to them, uh, you, 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 you know, I, I think it goes back to the parents, uh, regardless of how much or little uh, our children have, it goes uh, back to the parents and training to do, to do good with it. But yes, there is that challenge. Uh, as you see in a life like Solomon, it was always given to him, probably wasn't told no much. And you see some of the same problems that Solomon is doing and committing that his dad David did. You see some of the same problems. David was close enough to God that even though he made these mistakes, he repented and come, he was always coming back. Solomon, as we mentioned in our introduction, it's questionable if he did. You read the book of Ecclesiastes, maybe he straightened it up and repented. You read his life in 1 Kings, it seems as if he didn't. I don't know. Hopefully for his sake he did. Hey, thank you so much for being here, for your kind attention. Uh, we'll take just a quick break and then we'll have our devotional uh, thought and then we will pick up here next year, 2024.